Well, you know, it only makes sense that if you're going to speak about homecoming, well, then you got to be speaking about home, right? And so I pray that that's what you're prepared to hear this morning. You know, the number two has great significance in the Bible. God put two people in the Garden of Eden. Noah's animals went into the ark two by two. Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. God gave ten commandments, but on two tablets of stone, twice. And then atop the Ark of the Covenant were two cherubim angels made of gold whose wings came together to provide what's called the mercy seat for the presence of God. Two prostitutes once came to King Solomon arguing over a child. And he, in his wisdom, offered to split the child in two. But the mother of the child wouldn't have that. And Solomon ended up giving that child to the mother. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 4.9 that two are better than one. Amen? Because one, if one fails, then the other can lift him up. God's people were once split in two. Judah and Israel. The Bible has... Two testaments, the old and the new. Jesus said, though, on these two commandments, hang all the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus also said at his second coming that two men would be in the field. One would be taken and the other left. That two women would be grinding at the mill and one would be taken and the other will be left. Jesus fed 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. The Lord Jesus once appointed 70 disciples to be sent out. But he sent them out two by two. And he told them that the harvest is great. But the laborers are few. Christ Jesus hung on the cross between two thieves. Two men were on their way to Emmaus when they had an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus. Paul said of husbands and wives, the two shall become one. And today you're going to find that the Bible speaks of two gates, two trees, two ways, two foundations, two births, and two deaths. And also, at the conclusion of this message, you're going to find that you have two choices. Two choices that you can make today that will dictate where you're going to go when your life on earth is done. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And I'm going to begin in verse 13. And in my Bible, all these words are in red, which means these are coming straight from the lungs of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In verse 13, Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are as ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. 
Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, friend, for every purpose that God has, Satan has an alternative purpose. For every plan that God makes, Satan makes a counterfeit. And God desires good in your life while Satan desires your destruction. See, Satan tries to make that, that wide gate look similar to the narrow gate. And sometimes he even paints that broad way with religious colors. But wide, the wide gate and the broad way, they ain't nothing but Satan's attempts to lure millions of people into the fiery pits of hell. And that's why Jesus said, beware. Beware of those false prophets because they can be used to lead many, many into the broad way through that wide gate. Therefore, friend, my purpose today on this homecoming Sunday is to warn us once again of what Proverbs 16.25 tells us. That there is a way that seems right to man, but its end is a way of death. So today, in those verses in Matthew chapter 7, the Lord Jesus begins by pointing out two ways that you can spend Eternity. How many of you know that you're going to spend eternity somewhere? You're going to spend eternity somewhere. It's either going to be man's way or God's way. Now man's way to spend eternity involves relying on your own efforts, on what you think you can do to get there. This is a religion based on works. The rich young ruler said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But Jesus said in Matthew 7, 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Works. Have we not cast out demons in your name? Works. Have we not done many wonders in your name? Works. It seems that man has always sought to save himself. Adam and Eve tried it in the Garden of Eden. When they sinned, they tried to cover their sins by sewing fig leaves together to cover themselves so that God wouldn't see what they had done. But God didn't accept their efforts, and God won't accept ours either. There are two ways to eternal life. There's man's way, and there's God's way. The only problem with man's way is that man's way leads to an eternity in hell. While God's way leads to an eternity in heaven. So friend, what are you counting on? What are you counting on to get you to heaven? Are you counting on your baptism? Are you counting on your church attendance? What are you counting on to get you to heaven? Are you counting on your name being on the membership roll at Bethel Baptist Church? What are you counting on to get you to heaven? Are you counting on all those good things you've done? All the money you've given to the poor? Friend, can I tell you, those are all decent ways to live a life. But they are not ways to heaven. Without faith in Jesus Christ... All of those things lead to the very same place. Hell. That being said, let's take a look at God's way. God's way to spend eternity involves being born again. And Jesus addressed this in John chapter 3. In verse 1, we learned that there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. 
this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Let me tell you what that means right there. When, God, when Jesus says, be born of water, he's referring to the baptism of John. The baptism of John involved the baptism of repentance of sin. So Jesus is saying, it's only going to happen through repentance, and it's only going to happen through the power of the Spirit of God. Born of the Spirit and born of the water. And he goes on to say in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Friend, can I tell you that on the authority of God's word, that if you are not born twice, you will die twice. However, if you are born twice, you will only die once. You hang in there. I'll be clarifying that here in a moment. In Psalm 51, verse 5, the Bible tells us that every single person ever born on the face of this planet was born with a sin nature. You couldn't help it. You were born that way. David said, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin, my mother conceived me. I was born with it. Therefore, I must be born again with God's nature. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Paul said... God has made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, listen to me, to be sin for us. To be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Lord said, narrow is the gate, difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Why? Why are there so few who find it? Why is it so difficult? Let me tell you why. It's because man always wants to do things his way, not God's way. Jesus says there's two ways to eternity, but only one of them leads to heaven. But Jesus also pointed out that there are two ways to build a life. Once you're saved from the penalty of sin, once you are born again, as, as uh, Jesus put it to Nicodemus, there are two ways in which you can build your life. And he spoke about that in verses 24 in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, I will liken to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Two ways to build a life once you're saved. The foundation, as you know, is the most important part of a structure. The foundation is what determines the size of the structure, the shape of the structure. It's what determines the strength of the structure. Man's foundation involves rejecting the word of God, and basically that makes his foundation weak. Man builds on the shifting sands of a temporary world. But God's foundation involves the hearing, the believing, and the applying of God's word to every situation, to every decision, to every relationship that you'll ever encounter on this earth. God's way builds on the rock of a personal relationship with him found only through faith in Jesus Christ. But once that foundation is set, 
Once I've come to Christ on his terms, born again, blood bought, heaven bound, once my foundation is set, how am I supposed to build on that relationship? How am I supposed to build that life of faith? Well, you know, you got to build with the right materials. Paul spoke of these materials in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He said to these, these believers, okay, these are already believers, okay? So listen to what he says to these believers. He says, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So Paul is describing two different types of material that a Christian might use to build a Christian life on the foundation of Jesus. He mentions materials like gold, silver, and precious stones. When I think about those kinds of things, I think about things that are permanent, beautiful, and very valuable. But then he also describes materials like um, wood, hay, and stubble. Those things remind me of things that are passing, things that are temporary, things that are cheap. Friend, what are you building your life on? What are you building your Christian life on? Man's way builds on the sand, builds with wood and hay and stubble. Friend, what are you building your life on now that you're saved? Now that you're born again, what are you doing for the glory of God? How are you serving the Lord Jesus Christ? Every Christian is building. You're building one of two different kinds of structures. You're either building a structure for the Savior or you're building a structure for yourself. It's one or the other. And if you live for the things and the thrills of this world, then you are building a structure made of wood, hay, and stubble. You are building a structure for yourself, not for the Savior. And listen to me carefully. That structure will burn. That structure will fade away. There will be nothing left. And you will have nothing to show for your Christian life. And if you're building with those materials, one day you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. You're going to be there as a Christian. You're going to be there as a believer. But you'll stand there naked and ashamed. Because you will have built your Christian life with the wrong materials. Man's way builds on the shifting sand of this temporary world. Builds on the shifting sand of selfishness. But God's way builds on the rock. God's way builds with gold and silver and precious stones. What is he talking about here? He's talking about building a life of service to other people. He's talking about building a life of sacrifice and soul winning and submission. He's talking about, friend, making your life a holy life. He's talking about following the word of God as your pattern for life. He's talking about living a life surrendered to God. That's using the right materials. The great preacher Vance Havner once said, Christianity is not a happiness religion. Christianity is not a success religion. He said Christianity at its heart is a process by which where God makes saints out of sinners. After you come to Christ... God's design then becomes for you to conform you into the image of his son. We are not on some glorified picnic. A lot of truth in that. But it seems like to me that many Christians are suffering from what's called cheap Christianity. Cheap Christianity. Too many believers are going to show up in heaven and yes, they're going to be there. But they're going to show up in heaven and they're going to get there by the skin of their teeth. They're going to get there as cheaply as they possibly can. They're going to get there having prayed just enough prayers. They're going to get there having read just enough of the Bible. They're going to get there having served others just barely enough. And you got to wonder what that cheap Christianity is going to get for them. 
that kind of life. It's going to go up in smoke before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul tells us that Jesus Christ and him glorified in your life, throughout your life, is the only sure foundation in which we can build upon. So Jesus says, hey, there's two ways to eternity, but only one of them leads to heaven. And there's two ways you can build your life. You can build it cheaply or you can use the expensive materials that God provides you. But the Bible is also clear that there are two ways to die. It is a matter of fact. You will die. It is also a matter of fact that you will die in one of two ways. You will either die with Christ or you will die without Christ. One way or the other. If you ignore Bible teaching about God's sacrifice made for your sin and mine, then you will die without Christ. And you will be eternally separated from the Lord God in a place that's described with adjectives like suffering, turmoil, torment, anguish. I don't know about y'all, but I don't want no part of that. You see, an unsaved person dies twice. Not only will they die from this world physically, but they will also die spiritually once and for all. But the saved person who dies with Christ, yeah, he may pass from this life physically, but listen to me, he will never, ever die spiritually. An eternity with God is what's in store for you. And so this leaves us really with just two, two choices. Two choices for you to consider this morning. You can choose the broad way and suffer torment. The broad way is mere religion for religion's sake. The broad way involves just traditions for the sake of traditions. The broad way involves half-hearted living, being lukewarm, living a fleshly lifestyle, and all of those are part of the broad way. If living on the broad way is your method for getting to heaven, friend, you are going to miss heaven and you're going to land your tail right square smack in the middle of hell. Man says, but God is too loving to send somebody to hell. And can I tell you that that man is right? God doesn't send anyone to hell. But if you choose to go there, you can if you want to. God has done everything possible to keep you out of hell. So you can choose the broad way and suffer torment if you want to. Or you can choose the narrow way. And you can live with God eternally. In John 3.18, Jesus' words are recorded about this narrow gate. He says, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Friend, every unbeliever has done everything necessary to land themselves in hell. Nothing more is required. Unbelief is all that's necessary for a person to go to hell. Okay, okay, Bill. <laughs> what do I do to get saved? Peter said it. He said, repent, therefore, and be converted. Can I share with you where Peter said that? In Acts chapter 3. Peter and John had just made a lame man walk. And he's up there. He's rejoicing. He's jumping around in the synagogue. He's excited. And then people are astounded. At this miracle of God having been done through these disciples. And listen to what Peter says. 
He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. You remember Barabbas, right? You killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this lame man walk. Which comes to you has given perfect soundness in the presence of of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, it has thus been fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come to you in the presence of the Lord. Repent toward God. Change your mindset. Turn over everything about you over to God. You are no longer in charge. You are no longer the boss. Jesus is Lord. He is the boss. He is in charge. Repent. Change your mindset about that. And then place your trust in the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary's cross to cover your sins. When your sins are covered, God no longer sees them. Trust. Place your trust that Jesus' blood was sufficient. And then accept his death on the cross as full payment for your sins. Somebody had to pay. And if you accept Jesus by faith, then you don't have to pay anymore. Because Jesus paid it all. And then finally, what happened to my steak? Here it is. And finally, drive home. Drive home this steak of Romans 10, 13. Drive it home in your life, friend. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Drive that steak home in your Christian life. For many Christians, today is the day to come clean. You need to know who, who, what, and where you're relying on to get you to heaven. Who remembers the name, the band Millie Vanilli? Anybody remember them? Tiffany was the first one to raise her hand. You look like a Millie, Millie Vanilli kind of girl. You know what I'm saying? Here's the deal about Millie Vanilli. They were quite successful, sold millions of albums until the world found out that they didn't sing the songs on their albums. And then all of a sudden, it was time for them to face the music. No pun intended. One day, every one of us are going to stand before the Lord Jesus himself. We're going to stand before him. And some people have done a brilliant job of fooling others. But they're going to have to face the music. As a Christian, don't you worry about who that is. Let me look it over at your neighbors. You just make sure that you look in the mirror and make sure it ain't you. Make sure it's not you that's being the pretender. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul wrote to the believers there, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. So if you're honest, maybe here lately you've been putting on a pretty good show. Maybe you've got just about everybody convinced. Even your friends and family think, man, you're a pretty committed, committed believer. And you go to church every Sunday? Every Sunday? Yeah. But if you're honest, you've been living a double life. And the only one that knows it 
is Jesus in you. And one day, what you've been hiding all this time is going to be revealed. And when that happens, there will be nowhere to hide. And then you're going to realize that the only person you've been fooling is yourself. Today, whether it's the first time or another time, God has given you an opportunity to come clean and get right with him. Friend, it only comes through faith in Jesus. And our days are limited. Today may be your last. Some here today are at a crossroads in their life. It's ironic that we speak to graduates today because they're kind of at a crossroads. They're changing directions in their lives. Well, every one of us here today is kind of at a crossroads in our life. One arrow points to that broad way that leads to destruction. The other arrow points home, home to heaven. And you got to choose one. You got to choose one. Which way are you going to choose today? Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for the ultimate sacrifice of God on that cross. Father, I pray that each person here each person listening in has made a distinct choice to walk the narrow way. It's not easy. In fact, it's difficult. But Father, I pray that we will make the choice to no longer live a double life, to no longer live, live trying to straddle the fence. Rather, we will live wholly devoted and committed to walking the narrow way. Father, we know there are two ways to spend eternity. I want to spend it God's way. Lord, there are two ways to live. I want to spend it. I want to use it. I want to build my life on the rock. Lord, I know there are two ways to die. I want to die with Christ. And Father, I'm making the choice today to no longer live a double life but to live completely, utterly, 100% committed to the Lord Jesus who gave his life for me. Mm -hmm. Father, if there's anyone here who would like to join me in that profession, Father, I pray that you would use this decision time to bring them forward. Allow me to pray with them. Allow me to show them what the word of God says about how they can be saved if they haven't. And Father, I pray that great and mighty things are coming as a result of what you have done through your word this morning. Lord, we love you. We thank you for first loving us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And it's in his name we pray and all God's people said. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's sing.